Hi again everyone. Today on Thursday, October 30th, we are starting found on page 275 on chapter 30. Behind him, other kids began to scream in terror, but Jonah could only stare. It wasn't dark beyond the cave door. Darkness would be something. Darkness would mean that with a little light, there'd be plenty to see. Darkness would be comforting, actually. This was so much worse. There was just enough light filtering out from the cave to show that there were no trees anymore, no houses, no path, no rocks, no clouds, no sky. Nothing. It was like being deep in outer space, so far away from everything else that he couldn't even see any stars. We're in a black hole! Someone screamed behind him. Automatically, instinctively, Jonah hit the keypad again. 2-1-S-T. He hoped it was like the garage door opener at home, where the same code worked for opening and closing. Mercifully, the door began to roll shut again. It's not a black hole, another kid was explaining, sounding perfectly rational. In a black hole, the gravity would crush us. It reminds me of the Bible, a girl said thoughtfully. Genesis, the earth was without form and void. Jonah grabbed the not-a-black-hole boy and the girl who thought of the Bible and pulled them through the crowd. He wanted people by his side who could think while everyone else was screaming. He walked back to the adults, who were all sitting on the floor now, with their backs against the wall, Chip and Catherine pointing the taser and the elucidator at them. Gary and Mr. Hodge looked amused. J.B. and Angela looked distressed. Explain, Jonah demanded. Where are we? The more appropriate question, Mr. Hodge said teasingly, would be, when are we? J.B. kicked at him with both legs at once, since J.B.'s legs were tied together. Don't be cruel, J.B. said. This is bound to be very tra traumatic for all of them. He looked over at the screaming, hysterical mass of kids clustered by the door, then back at Jonah. We call this time hollow. When they shut the door, Hodge and Gary pulled this whole cave outside of time. So what? Like, we don't exist now? The not-a-black-hole kid asked. Jonah glanced at him more closely now. He had curly blonde hair, kind of like Chips. His name tag said Alex. No, J.B. said. We exist, but now doesn't. Why not, the girl said. Her name tag said Emily. J.B. glanced toward the hysterical crowd once more. Get them calmed down, he said, and make them sit on the benches again. Hodge and Gary and I will explain everything. We will, Gary growled. I will, J.B. said, and it's fine with me if they hear only my version. We'll explain too, Hodge muttered. It took forever to get all the kids back to the benches, to get them to be quiet. Jonah thought he and Emily and Alex had accomplished it when one, gr when one kid happened to glance at his cell phone. It still says 1018, he screamed. It said 1018 mo since we got here. Shh, shh, Emily soothed him. Sometimes cell phones break. She sat behind him, holding his hand, and that seemed to calm him down. Catherine, Chip, and a few other kids had worked to pull the adults to the front of the room. They stood like dangerous prisoners on trial, Catherine and Chip guarding them from the side. Just show them the presentation, Hodge was suggesting. You mean your commercial, J.B. sneered? No way. You can give the counterpoint afterward, Gary said. We promise. Let them, Angela said. You showed it to me. J.B. frowned, then shrugged. All right, he said. Go into demo mode on that elucidator, sugar, Hodge told Catherine. See the demo button at the top? Catherine glared, offended by the sugar. But she seemed to be following his orders. Let me guess, she said. The one that says adoption promo? You got it, Hodge said. Now aim at the wall. Instantly, on the front wall of the cave, a movie screen appeared. No, Jonah went over and touched it. It was still solid rock. No light shone from the elucidator, but it was clearly the source of both the screen and the images that suddenly glowed from the screen, shifting photographs of hundreds of faces, seeming to represent every era and culture in history. Despite the rock surface, the faces were clear and unruffled. This was beyond high definition. It was like watching reality. From the time humankind achieved time travel, a voice boomed out, just like in a movie preview. People have stirred with compassion for the sufferings of the past. What followed was a montage of images that Jonah could barely stand to watch. People lost their heads to guillotines. Soldiers on horseback ran swords 
through infants. Bodies fell into pits dug to bury the living with the dead. It went on and on, agonizingly. Jonah felt like he'd seen all the worst moments of human history by the time the killings finally ended. I'm not allowed to watch R-rated movies, a kid behind Jonah screamed. Make it stop! Shh, it's over now, a girl's voice comforted. It's in the past. Jonah looked back. It was Emily again. On the screen now, all the death and destruction was replaced by a grim-faced man sitting in what appeared to be a TV studio. A caption at the bottom of the screen identified him as Curtis Rathbone, CEO, Interchronological Rescue. The past was a very brutal place, he intoned solemnly, but as much as modern humanity's hearts went out to their ancestors, their antecedents, they knew that the paradox and the ripple would make intervention very difficult. Pause for a moment, will you? JB called out. I think you need a few definitions. Catherine squinted at the elucidator. Where is... Oh, wait, wait, I got it. Curtis Rathbone, CEO, froze on the screen. The paradox, JB called out. That's the possibility that time travelers might cause some event in the past that would lead to their own non-existence. Such as, for instance, accidentally killing their own parents. And the ripple is what we call any significant change caused by time travelers, which then alters the present and the future. Think of a stone thrown into a pond, and the way the ripples spread out to the very edge of the water. Is that clear? Does everyone understand? Jonah expected the other kids to begin shouting out, Time travel? What are you talking about? Are you nuts? Or the ripple? The paradox? Yeah, right. Try the psych ward. But then he turned around, and the faces all around him were as solemn as Curtis Rathbones. The other kids had seen the nothingness outside of their cave, and they were ready for explanations, however far-fetched. Okay, back to the propaganda, JB said. On the screen, Curtis Rathbone began talking again. We here at Interchronological Rescue were determined to take action, he said. We study time very carefully, centuries of worth of wars, genocide, famines, and pestilence, all the very worst of human suffering. And we discovered hundreds whose deaths were so horrendous, so chaotic, so terrible, we knew we had to save them. And we knew we could. Someone gasped behind Jonah. That's right, Curtis Rathbone said, almost as if he'd heard the gasp. Rescue was possible. Oh, we knew we couldn't save everyone. Much as we would have liked to, say, save every victim from the 20th century European Holocaust, we knew that was off limits. The ripple would have been extreme. Too much happened as a result of that Holocaust. But to save even the small, insignificant victims of the past, the orphans of history, as it were, didn't our own humanity demand that we try? A single tear glistened in Curtis Rathbone's eye. He dabbed at it and smiled fleetingly out from the screen. We began ten years ago, rescuing children of the Spanish Inquisition, he said. Babies left in houses that were then burned to the ground, children for dead who were easily removed by our modern techniques. We could save them, save them without causing a ripple or a paradox, because they had as good as vanished from history, even without our intervention. And thus, we could transform those dark days of humanity into a triumph of the human spirit of modern humanitarianism. Now he beamed out at the crowd, the terrors of history receding into the past. The response of the modern age has been overwhelming, Rathbone continued. Everyone was eager to adopt a desperate child from the past, to reach out across centuries to save some poor soul who had never had a chance. Within five years, we are running ten rescue missions a week, in every century since the beginning of time. Our generous age paid for plastic surgery for Neanderthals, counseling for war refugees, constructive sur reconstructive surgery for landmine victims, and then we perfected our age reversal techniques so the children we rescued didn't even have to remember their ordeals. We could deliver perfect, happy, healthy, bouncing babies to our clients. That's enough, JB snarled. Turn it off. Catherine must have managed to hit the right buttons because Curtis Rathbone disappeared from sight. Maybe it was Jonah's imagination, but the lights in the room seemed a bit brighter as well. Perhaps Curtis Rathbone had humanitarian intentions in the beginning, J.B. growled. Perhaps. He did, Hodge shouted. He does. J.B. ignored him. But what interchronological rescue became was something entirely different, he said bitterly. 
purveyors of prestigious names from history for our wealthy idiots who want to brag at their cocktail parties. Oh yes, my little Henry comes from a line of British kings. Didn't you try to kidnap Amelia Earhart out of the skies over the Pacific? Didn't you lure Ambrose Bierce to the Mexican border? The age reversal doesn't work on adults, Gary muttered. You know that now, J.B. countered. Hold on, Jonas said, because no one else was speaking up. Age reversal? J.B. flashed him an angry glance, then turned his glare back to Hodge. Traumatized children from traumatic times in history have a lot of issues, J.B. said sarcastically. There were problems interchronological rescues had never wanted to talk about, never wanted the perspective adoptive parents to know about. Erase the memories and you erase the problems, Hodge said cheerily. What's wrong with that? Jonas stared at Hodge, trying to understand. This is one of the few parts of the theory I was right about, Angela spoke up apologetically. They had turned you all into babies again, even though some of you had once been much older, teenagers even. Angela's words seemed to echo in the stone room, turned you all into babies again. Watching J.B.'s outrage, Jonah had almost forgotten that any of this time travel talk had anything to do with him. Us? He whispered. You're talking about us? J.B. was still glaring at Hodge and Gary. Interchronological rescue got sloppy, he accused. They began taking children whose disappearances were noticed. They caused ripple upon ripple upon ripple. He closed his eyes, pained beyond the words. Oh, and your intervention worked so well, Hodge accused. We could have repaired the ripples. We could have put a few children back if we had to. But no, you and your friends insisted on attacking right in the middle of the time stream. The time crash was not my fault, J.B. screamed. If you just surrendered, you're the one who chose to speed away, to slam into the time frame, to ruin her life, he pointed at Angela. To nearly destroy 13 years of time. No, to destroy all of time. Even tied up, they were about to come to blows again. Jonah had had it. He'd had it with the suspense. There are implications, the accusations, the strain. He stood up. That wasn't enough. He climbed on top of a bench and yelled, Who are we? J.B. and Hodge fell silent. Then J.B. said, Show them. They're going to have to find out eventually. It's F6 on the elucidator, Hodge said. Jonah watched his sister hit a button. The screen reappeared, displaying a chart. It was a seating chart, Jonah realized, like for a classroom or an airplane. He stepped down from the bench to get a closer look and squinted at the names. Seat 1A, Virginia Dare. 1B, Edward of England. 1C, Richard of Shrewsbury. His eyes skimmed down the list, looking for boys' names or names that sounded familiar. 9B, John Hudson. 10C, Henry Fountain. 11A, Anastasia Romanov. 12B, Alexis Romanov. 12C, Charles Lindbergh III. That's who you are, JB said quietly. You are the missing children of history. Chapter 31 Which one am I? Jonah demanded, but his voice got lost in the sea of voices around him, all calling out the same question and shouting. How could it be? That's not possible. I can't believe it. Believe it, J.B. said, his voice ca carrying over the shouts. It's true. Incredibly, Mr. Hodge was nodding, too. Virginia Dare, he said, first child born of English parents in the Americas, who vanished with the rest of Roanoke Colony. Edward and Richard, the British princes who vanished from the Tower of London in 1483. Anastasia and Alexis, the two youngest children of Tsar Nicholas II, who disappeared during the Russian Revolution. The kidnapped Lindbergh baby, the so-called eaglet. It was my best rescue mission ever. It was your worst rescue mission ever, J.B. retorted. If we hadn't discovered how to hold back the ripple, just temporarily, just until we can heal all the wounds, until we can return the children to their rightful place in history, Jonah's head was spinning. He knew he should be paying attention, listening closely. He had a feeling that J.B. was just had just said something important, but he couldn't quite grasp what he meant, couldn't quite understand. What? This was Catherine exploding. You want to send everyone back in time? Oh, that's what J.B. meant. That was important, all right. 
Suddenly, the whole room was quiet. Everyone stunned into silence at once. Catherine turned the elucidator away from the wall, aiming at J.B. once more. You can't do that, she said. I won't let you. J.B. held out his hands apologetically, a particularly pitiful gesture with his rest, wrists bound. I'm sorry, he said softly. I wish there were some other way. It's not fair to any of you. But some of you are royalty, or children of explorers. You can understand the need to sacrifice for your country, to take risks for all of humankind. This is even more important. Yes, returning you to history may be dangerous for many of you, even deadly. But think of it as your chance to save the world. To give your own life in order to help every other person on the planet for all time. Someone began clapping. It was Mr. Hodge. Oh, very noble, he said sarcastically, his hands clapping too slow and exaggerated to be sincere. What a pretty speech. But you forget, my friend, that these children haven't been raised as royalty or as sacrificial lambs. They think of themselves as 21st century Americans. They're selfish, spoiled, overprivileged, the richest society in history up to this point. They aren't capable of sacrifice. Jonah waited for some kid to speak out, to complain, we're not selfish, but nobody said a word. They were all watching Mr. Hodge. What I'm offering, myself and Gary, that is, is the glorious future, he said, even more privileged that you've ever imagined, technology beyond your wildest dreams. I mean, we have time travel. You can be sure that the video games will be truly awesome. His eyes seemed to twinkle hypnotically. I want to complete my original mission. That ripple effect he's so worried about, he pointed at J.B. jeeringly. Puh! You won't even feel it. He took a hop step toward Catherine. He seemed to be... He seemed barely constrained by the ropes around his ankles. We've worked so hard to bring you all together again, he said softly now. The time crash put 13 years off limits, but we came back for you as soon as we could. Just hand me that elucidator, sweetie, and we can all be on our way. There are families waiting for you. Catherine jerked the elucidator back, away from Mr. Hodge. All the kids here already have families, she said coldly. She stared defiantly toward Jonah, as if she expected him to spring to her side, to link arms and agree, yeah, what she said. He didn't move. And if we do what you want, we'd have to go back to being babies again, a voice said quietly from the crowd. Jonah looked back. It was Andrea Crowell, the girl with braids. We'd have to forget everything, forget our entire lives, forget everyone we've ever known. Well, uh, yes, but it's not like you'd even remember that you'd forgotten anything, Mr. Hodge said, looking uncomfortable. You'd be perfectly happy in the future, I promise. Jonah looked from Mr. Hodge to J.B., both of them were staring back at him as if they expected him to make some sort of decision. He glanced back over his shoulder. Several of the other kids were peering anxiously toward him as well. Why? Oh, yeah, Jonah thought. I did kind of take charge before, grabbing the elucidator, capturing Angela, opening the door, closing the door. He felt like climbing up on top of the bench again and calling out, Hey, guess what? I'm good at quick things. Snap decisions. Rash actions. That's all. This one's too big for me. Someone would have to think about this one for a long, long time. That's not my department. But no one else was talking. Jonah sighed. What if we just want to stay in our own time, he asked. This is where we belong. The 21st century, I mean. But the future is even better, Mr. Hodge said, as J.B. interjected. No, you really don't want, be don't belong in the 21st century. Yes, we do, Jonah said stubbornly. J.B. shook his head. It was just a mistake, all of you ending up where you did, when you did. Hodge was carrying his load of stolen babies to the future, and we, those of us who enforce the laws of time travel, knew we had to stop him as soon as we could. There's a protocol to stopping the middle of the time stream. Steps everyone agrees to, to avoid doing even more damage. Hodge broke every rule. Oh, come on now, that's impossible, Hodge said mockingly. You time fanatics have so many rules, it'd take an eternity to break them all. JB stared at Hodge. Jonah could hear a few kids in the back of the room snickering. I'm not explaining this well enough, J.B. said, looking past Jonah. It's really complicated, but I'll try to put this in terms you can understand. It'd be like a criminal kidnapping a bunch of babies in New York City and trying to fly them to Los Angeles. 
but when he is caught in the middle of the country, he refuses to give up. Instead, he crash lands in Kansas City and sets off a nuclear weapon that completely destroys the Midwest. He paused, looking down at the ropes around his wrists. Then he peered up again, earnestly. I'm trying to undo that nuclear explosion. Everyone was silent for a long moment. Then Catherine complained. That's a stupid comparison. A nuclear explosion in Kansas City would kill all the stolen babies, too. Other kids began muttering as well. Jonah heard Alex say, but the nuclear fallout blowing toward Los Angeles would be kind of like that time ripple thing he was talking about. Jonah held up his hand. To his amazement, everyone stopped talking. Okay, I get that nobody planned for us to end up here, he said, but that's what happened, and so we've lived all our lives in the 20th and 21st century, so this is where we belong now. It's what we know. It's where our families are. His eyes skimmed over Catherine's face as he said that. She smiled encouragingly. Look, Joan appeared at Mr. Hodge, you're just going to have to find some other babies for those families in the future. And you, he turned his attention toward J.B., you're going to have to figure out some other way to fix the ripple, to save time. I'm sure you can think of something. I don't know about the other kids, but I'm staying here. This would have come off very well, very dramatically, except that he realized he wasn't saying exactly the right thing and was forced to add weakly. I mean, I'm staying now. Whatever. You know what I mean. Mr. Hodge smiled slightly. That's what I've always loved about 21st century Americans, he said. They're always so convinced that what they can control their own that they can tr can control their own destinies. Go on then, walk out that door, have a nice life. And then Jonah remembered that the nothingness on the other side of the door, the fact that the 21st century and everything else outside the cave had disappeared. Tell me the code to go home, he said. Please. Mr. Hodge shook his head. Jonah turned toward JB. After a second's hesitation, J.B. began shaking his head, too. You're going to have to choose, he said. Your now is off limits. Which will it be, the future or the past?